Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Hello. What a great atmosphere in the room. I could leave you alone all afternoon and you'd be just fine. Welcome to the 2017 Human Rights Awards. My name is Jeremy Fernandez and today we're here to celebrate the inspiring achievements of individuals and organisations advancing human rights in their communities. For the third year running, it is just amazing to have 500 of us gathered here today to recognise extraordinary people making a difference in their communities. As you well know, it's been a historic week in Australia for human rights with the passage of legislation on marriage equality. A wonderful achievement for our country. We'll have more about that a bit later. But before I go any further, I'd like to mention a few practicalities. I'd like to introduce our Auslan interpreters, Natalie Kuhl, Kathy Wright, and Neil Phipps, who's here as well. Now, if I can invite you to please turn your mobile phones to silent as well. Don't switch them or fall together. We'd like you to use the hashtag HRA2017 on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. It's not just about bragging that you're here. It's also to share some of those moments, some of your highlights, some of your pictures of this afternoon's event. We'd love to hear your comments. But please, for your own protection, keep your hands to yourself. Don't drink and tweet at the same time. <laughs> and unlike certain uh, heads of state, please refrain from describing your colleagues as short and fat or old lunatics. Right, let's begin. First up today, I'd like to welcome Auntie Norma Ingram to the stage to perform the Welcome to Country. Auntie Norma Ingram. Are you all awake? Yeah. Lovely, of course you are. Budjere uh, Gomorawa. Greetings in the local Aboriginal language. It is such a pleasure for me to be here, and they've invited me back, Jeremy, so they must like me. Um, it, it's always a pleasure, but with great responsibility. So if we welcome you to country, the big responsibility is on me by doing that. But I'm also going to say, I'll shift that responsibility on you as Australians. So what we do today with the Welcome to Country is we welcome you to the traditional land where we are on now. And that opens up and when we play our clapsticks to let Mother Earth and our spiritual ancestors know that we are here, it opens up a lot. It opens up Mother Earth, it opens up our culture. Um, I've said hello to you in the local Sydney language. I'm a Redfern girl at the moment, been a Redfern girl for a little while on Gadigal uh, country, my adopted country. My actual uh, mother's mother's land is the other side of the Blue Mountains, a little town called Cowra. So what I do, and I'm, I was born and raised on the Aboriginal reserve there, while still being now in Gadigal country. It's just a wonderful experience for me and, and it's just, just terrific for me uh, personally. But um, what we need to do now is we need to acknowledge Mother Earth and that's what we do. So in my language and the old people tell us, you really need to be able to speak your language to talk to Mother Earth. So I'm a Wiradjuri woman, don't know if there are any other Wiradjuri people in the, in the room, but welcome. So in my language, it's Yamadu Murang, Yundu, Norma Ingram, Galia Wiradjuri. So I'm a Lachlan River girl, Kaura Wiradjuri. Um, but I just said to you, Yama, and I know we've got some Wiradjuri people, we've got some other people from right across this country who are Aboriginal, and I want to also acknowledge the Torres Strait Islanders. And so some of you have seen me do this, and I do it all the time because I love it. Um, I'm going to get you to look at somebody else and probably if you, there's somebody that you haven't met before, you haven't seen, and just look at them and say, Yama. I know Alastair knows Yama. this. <laughs> Alastair knows it, don't you, Alastair? <laughs> I was talking about you, Alastair. <laughs> 
So Yama um, is more than just hello, it's I see you. We had, um, excuse me, we had a big win yesterday, as, uh, as was mentioned. And we know that people go through life and nobody says hello to them. And so if you can just, in your daily life, at least once a day, acknowledge somebody else, it makes your life good, but it also makes their life good. It's just amazing what a little acknowledgement does. And so this is what we do. We acknowledge people, we acknowledge country. And that's what we do. So welcome to country is also welcome you um, uh, to the culture and to the people. We are on the traditional land of the Gadigal people, one of 29 small clan groups of the Eora Nation. So the Eora Nation, um, for those particularly who know the east side, is bounded by the Hawkesby River to the north, the Nepean River, just this side of those mountains, the Blue Mountains, um, and the Georges River. So you could just imagine what life was like here for the Gadigal, who were here to welcome in those tall ships from England when they came in. It took a long time for them to get here. But the Gadigal lived an idyllic life. They are saltwater people. Sunrise, the sunrise has come up, comes up this side and it sits over the western side and it's lovely to see some Western Australian people here with us as well. And so um, their totem is the whale or the gurawal. And all of that makes up who we are as Aboriginal people. And when we do welcome, we do that by our songs, our dances, our artwork, our stories, our storylines, all to acknowledge Mother Earth. She looks after us. And if we don't look after her, we, do, we will suffer consequences for that. So as I said earlier, yes, I'm an Aboriginal elder from this local community, um, so I have responsibilities, as, as uh, my cultural responsibilities. But that responsibility is also for you as Australians, wherever you've come from across this great land. Over 200 different language groups right across, and all of our people, and I want to acknowledge all our Aboriginal people wherever you've come from today and the Torres Strait Islander people. I want to acknowledge your elders. I want to acknowledge the work that you do in your communities. And you're not always standing there saying, hey, look what I've done. Give me. You know, that's not what happens. It's about, I'm in there because I know I can do this work. And, you, and many of you are going to be honoured for that work that you do, and I congratulate you all for that. I do want to acknowledge all of our elders, past and present, and that's the future generation as well, the young ones. We as Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, we have a responsibility to pass on our culture. We have a responsibility to nurture and teach the next generation. So wherever you come from, welcome. Welcome to Aboriginal land. Wherever you go back to when you're, when you're finished, May our spiritual ancestors walk with you. Good health to you all and to your family. And next year, um, next year's theme for NAIDOC is about the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander women across this ancient land, the most ancient land. And um, the theme is, because of her, we can. And that is fantastic. First time that women have been acknowledged. And I say that also about Mother Earth. Because of her, we can. Welcome everybody and enjoy your, your um, lunch. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. What a warm and generous welcome, Auntie Norma, thank you. Now today is about celebrating the work of outstanding finalists, but also more generally about celebrating all the people in this room who contribute to the rights and freedoms of every single Australian. It might be the lawyer doing pro bono work for people with mental illness, or the nun visiting those in detention week after week, or the advocate highlighting cases of elder abuse. To all, each and every one of you, thank you. In the 30 years of these awards, the Commission doesn't believe it's ever had such an impressive field of contenders for finalists for the Human Rights Medal. There can only be one medal winner, but every one of our finalists is doing incredible work in human rights. This is true of all the finalists across the different categories as well, each of whom is making a real contrib contribution to their communities and to broader society as well. 
Detailed information about each of the finalists is available uh, on your program. For those who miss out on a trophy, please apply again next year because your work is enduring. It has been, as I said, a significant year in human rights with some setbacks but also some major achievements we should mark. Just yesterday, we witnessed the Parliament formally legislate for marriage equality after an overwhelming result in a public survey. So let's take a moment to celebrate what has been a long and hard-fought struggle for equality. What a day for love, um, for equality, for respect. Australia has done it. Yes, responses. 7,817,000. The Australian people have spoken in their millions and they have voted overwhelmingly yes for marriage equality. They voted yes for fairness. They voted yes for commitment. They voted yes for love. By passing this bill, we are saying to those vulnerable young people, there is nothing wrong with you. You are not unusual. You are not abnormal. You are just you. There is nothing to be embarrassed about. There is nothing to be ashamed of. There is nothing to hide. You are a normal person, and like every other normal person, you have a need to love. How you love is how God made you. Whom you love is for you to decide and others to respect. Ryan Patrick Bolger, will you marry me? <laughs> we'll put this. Should let Hansard note to record that that was a yes. <laughs> Congratulations. How wonderful. Congratulations to all those in the LGBTI community who fought long and hard, long and hard for marriage equality. It's also been a significant year at the Australian Human Rights Commission. The organisation has farewelled Professor Gillian Triggs as president and welcomed the new emeritus, Professor Rosalind Croucher. As well as being an eminent lawyer, what you may not know is that Rosalind is also uh, a singer in a choir. She plays the oboe and cor anglais. There will be a quiz on that later. Just kidding. And she's also an avid history buff. I'd like to welcome Ros to the stage to deliver this year's keynote address. Ros Croucher. Thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, Auntie Norma Ingram, for your wonderful welcome to country. The Australian Human Rights Commission is honoured once more to be on Gadigal land, and I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and acknowledge Elders past and present and future and acknowledge the many Indigenous guests that are sharing this special day with us today. The attorney I trust is going to join us, so I'm welcoming the attorney. He had some important business in Canberra. He and the Prime Minister had an important royal assent to attain today. And it's extraordinarily prescient, I think, that while Human Rights Day is the 10th of December, about which I'll speak shortly, we are holding our day on the day that the marriage amendment, definitions and religious freedoms bill 2017 passed into law. <laughs> Distinguished guests, commissioners, all seven of you, sprinkled throughout our vast audience, award finalists, family, welcome all. We are on Gadigal land, but we are also in the depths of the General Post Office of Sydney. 
The GPO is a, a crucial landmark in Australia's modern history. It's not quite all roads lead to Rome, but all distances in New South Wales are measured from the GPO. We're in the heart of that measurement point today. The GPO opened in 1874, and Martin Place, which is to the north of us, which if I have my directions correct, is that away. Martin Place filled with joyous celebrations at key moments in that modern history, particularly at the end of the two major world wars. And it was also fitting that in Martin Place, that each year on Remembrance Day is also the time that we remember those who served in those wars and other conflicts into which our nation has um, been involved. The clock tower, which stands proudly above us, we can't see it, but the, the clock tower was one of the tallest structures during the Second World War, and it had to be taken down because after the midget submarines came into Sydney Harbour and bombed the eastern suburbs and sank the HMAS Cutterball, it was thought that this might be um, in jeopardy of air attack, so they took the clock tower down. But then in 1964, at the Anzac Day dawn service, the bells rang again, chiming the hour and each quarter, and it has done so prettily, pretty unceasingly since that time, sounding on the hour the deep, sonorous A, which I have to say, as an oboist, is carved into one's sonic memory. <laughs> Human Rights Day is marked on the 10th of December because it was on the 10th of December in 1948 that the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted Resolution 217A-3, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so each year on the 10th of de December, we commemorate Human Rights Day. And next year, we will mark the 70th anniversary of this defining document for the modern age. The preamble of the declaration proclaimed that it would be a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance. These are lofty words indeed, but to become meaningful, they have to permeate everything that nations do and become essential rep reference points for how their citizens act. Universal and effective recognition is one thing, Universal and effective observance is another. And here, we all play our part. The Australian Human Rights Commission plays a central role in that process of permeation, both in the domestic context, but also the international arena. This past year has seen the Commission appear several times in the international context as the National Human Rights Institution. We sit between government and the collective grouping of civil society in the UN structure. Neither government nor civil society, but each playing a vital and different role. In the concluding observations of each of the reviews, the UN Human Rights Committee delivers a report card of sorts commending the government on a range of achievements, but also condemning it on others, and pointing to areas where the committee considers that improvement is needed. And this is where the Human Rights Commission can play a powerful role as trusted advisor. The observations themselves provide instructive guidance for the continuing dialogue between the commission and government through its ministers and departments to address human rights concerns 
and failings identified in those processes. Good relationships and open doors are absolutely crucial for us to be able to play that role of advisor to its fullest. To be the devil's advocate, as I have said, even at times to be the devil's blowtorch for which you need to have a respected, indeed trusted seat at the table. Within the domestic context, so much of the contribution and achievements of the Commission are found in work that continues day after day, year after year, often unnoticed and unobserved, and now for over 30 years. There is, for example, the huge public contribution through the National Information Service and the investigation and complaint handling functions of the Commission. Extraordinary numbers of people are helped through that service. Approximately 15,000 people a year contact the Commission. Individuals asking questions and sometimes employers wanting to know the right thing to do and not sure how to go about it. 2,000 of those translate into complaints and nearly all of them are resolved through a very strong conciliation program with a high success rate. Of those that are conciliated, about 75% are conciliated successfully. The participants in the evaluation that is conducted after each of those is very, very strong. The word that stands out in so many of them is the professionalism with which they were treated. Not only from those who are complainants, but also from those who are respondents. So 1,700 people or so each year are assisted very constructively through the process, and often with outcomes that benefit the wider public. Just think of the station announcements that are now largely audible on New South Wales trains. Thanks to the complaint of one person, Graham Innes. <laughs> who you probably guessed is here today. <laughs> I note also the very large educational outreach program, including the many resources on rights and freedoms on the Commission's website. One simple example is of the teaching resources and video prepared for the 800th anniversary of the sealing of the Magna Carta of 1215. Aimed at high school students, the video was accessed around 50,000 times last year. Here is an extract. It's an 800-year-old document written on dried animal skin in England on the other side of the world in a language we no longer use that most people couldn't read even back then. So why is Magna Carta important to us in Australia today? Because it was the starting point for some of our most important human rights, things it's easy to take for granted. For instance, before Magna Carta, life was pretty cruisy. If you were a king, you could get away with all kinds of things forming your own armies, invading other countries whenever you fancied, and taxing people to pay for wars without even asking. Now, there were laws in those days, but some rulers believed they had absolute power and simply ignored them. That changed in 1215, when a group of landowning barons finally had enough of King John's behaviour. They decided the king governed by their consent, not just because he was king. So they got together and forced the king to agree to limit his powers by signing Magna Carta. It was the beginning of fairer rights for the people. The king also agreed he couldn't just add new taxes. Free men had to be represented by a common council to be taxed, which started the evolution of democracy. It's cute. And it's an extract, but its message is simple and very powerful. The Commission also provides crucial assistance to the court through acting as an invited intervener. I highlight this because most recently, 
in the family court proceeding, re Kelvin, the full court handed down a crucial judgment on the 30th of November. What is most heartening and affirming of that uh, decision was that the reasoning adopted by the majority judges in the case strongly reflected our submissions, a testimony to the experience and judgment of those involved. And as a result of that decision, court authorization is no longer required for hormonal treatment for young transgender people, where, where there is no dispute between the parents, medical practitioners and the young person, and where the treatment to be administered is in accordance with published best practice guidelines. In guiding the court on this delicate... <laughs> Thank you. In guiding the court on this delicate navigation through precedent and current best practice, I acknowledge publicly the leadership of Graham Edgerton of the Commission's legal team. and also the absolutely fantastic and pro bono contribution of barrister Huda Yunan and her reader, Joe Edwards. <laughs> Other work of the Commission in the public arena is the expression of our mandate of promoting human rights standards in the review of legislation and submissions to parliamentary inquiries, through engagement with the community, like the launch last Friday of Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar's project on Indigenous women and girls, We Yani Uthangadi, Women's Voices. <laughs> the Racism It Stops With Me campaign, led by Race Discrimination Commissioner Dr. Tim Sue Pomazan, Age Discrimination Commissioner, the Honourable Dr. Kay Patterson's leadership in implementing the Elder Abuse and Willing to Work reports. Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Alistair McEwan's upcoming and vitally important project on violence against people with disability in institutional settings. And Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo's timely work on human rights and technology to mark the 70th anniversary next year of the Declaration on Human Rights. We also promote human rights standards through conducting inquiries, like the Change the Course report commissioned by Australian universities and led by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins and National Children's Commissioner Megan Mitchell's leadership on the development of national principles for child safe organisations. You can clap them. I'm very proud of their work. There is also the extraordinary partnerships that we have with major agencies like the Defence Force and key government departments, DFAT, the Attorney General's Department and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and other organisations out in the community like the AFL and Rugby League. In undertaking these various roles, I wish to pay tribute to my fellow commissioners, all seven of you. And because this is a mega event, it hasn't happened without an enormous amount of behind the scenes work. I mentioned this morning in a morning tea with our finalists, Liz Tan and her team. I think the extraordinary success of getting this event together must be attributed to Liz and the communications team. And of course, all of our executive assistants, some of the most important people in any organisation. And I want to recognise Commission staff, many of whom have served the Commission faithfully through many a year and sometimes through a tempest or two. At times, the public may lose sight of and some may even lose faith in what we do. But history will put this in perspective and measure us truly against our mandate to promote and protect human rights, to set the beacons of human rights and to lead people and government there. And so, leading into the awards, one of the drafters of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of Franklin Roosevelt, president of the US from 1933 to 1945. Writing on the 10th anniversary of the declaration in 1958, Mrs. Roosevelt asked, 
Where do human rights begin? They begin, she said, in small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. In the world of the individual person, the neighbourhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. I welcome the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Australia, Senator the Honourable George Brandis. And so this year, as we've said, marks the 30th anniversary of our, our Human Rights Day Awards since the Commission established the Human Rights Medal. Other prestigious awards have been added over time to celebrate the efforts of those who work tirelessly every day to bring human rights home. Such places may not be seen on any maps, in Eleanor Roosevelt's words, but today we honour and recognise you, our finalists and award winners, for your contributions in giving meaning to human rights. We give you a place on our human rights map. The catalyst for some of our awards is born out of tragedy. The catalyst for others is wrought in anger translated into fierce determination to effect change. Some wish to expose human rights abuses so that redress may come. Others are seized with an idea to change the world. The unifying theme is one of resilience and of profound optimism that in our everyday spaces, the world of the individual person of which Eleanor Roosevelt spoke, we can make a difference. There is much to celebrate, but there is much still to do. Today, we honour the outstanding achievement of contributors to the mission embraced in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 69 years ago. To conclude, I love prize givings. <laughs> but a final word. As we sit here beneath a very splendid building, appropriately designed in Italian Renaissance style, so fitting for a modern Australia, what we can't see is that the bells, in addition to bearing the monogram VR for Victoria Regina, and the words General Post Office 1890, are inscribed lines from Tennyson's poem in memoriam from 1849. Ring out the false, ring in the true, Ring out the feud of rich and poor. Ring in redress to all mankind. Ring out false pride in place and blood. Ring in the common love of good. This could indeed be an anthem of Human Rights Day. Ring in the common love of good. What an uplifting address, Ros, thank you very much. So, that brings us to lunch. Now, over the lunch break, we're going to be showing you some of the best photographs from our human rights photographic competition on the theme of home. The winner of the under-18 under category was a picture taken by 16-year-old James Corbin of Sydney. He titled it, Homeless, Yet Happier Than Most People. The over-18 category was won by Robin Yong of Canberra for her photograph titled Flowers of Ethiopia. The photograph was taken in the Omo Valley, known as one of the cradles of humanity. 
where a major dam project has forced the relocation of tens of thousands of people. Thanks also to the major sponsor, Olympus, and also to Memento Photo Books. We'll break now for lunch, and we'll be back with the awards in just a few moments. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sorry to break up the socialising. This clearly is one of the highlights of the afternoon, to get around the room and meet some of the amazing people who are here. We're going to get the awards started in just a second, so I'd invite you to take your seats, please, and we'll get underway. Now, I'd like to welcome shortly a man who's had a very busy week and has just raced up from Canberra, having played a very important role in the marriage equality debate. Now, I know many of you were very moved by the uh, video that the Commission compiled um, highlighting the events of the past 24 hours, the past week. So indulge us, we're going to play that video again so Senator Brandis can see it. What a day for love, um, for equality, yeah, for respect. Australia has done it. Yes, responses. 7,817,000. The Australian people have spoken in their millions and they have voted overwhelmingly yes for marriage equality. They voted yes for fairness. They voted yes for commitment. They voted yes for love. By passing this bill, we are saying to those vulnerable young people, there is nothing wrong with you. You are not unusual. You are not abnormal. You are just you. There is nothing to be embarrassed about. There is nothing to be ashamed of. There is nothing to hide. You are a normal person, and like every other normal person, you have a need to love. How you love is how God made you. Whom you love is for you to decide and others to respect. Ryan Patrick Bowles, you really know me. <laughs> we'll put this. Should let Hansard note to record that that was a yes. <laughs> Congratulations. What a wonderful show of democracy and unity in politics. Please welcome to the stage the Attorney General, Senator George Brandis. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jeremy, and may I begin, as is customary, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather, the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. May I acknowledge the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher, and the members, the Commissioners of the Australian Human Rights Commission, I think all of whom are here today. Might I acknowledge the Honourable Mark Dreyfus QC, the Shadow Attorney General, and the President of the Law Council of Australia, Fiona McLeod SC. Most particularly, I want to acknowledge the finalists for the awards that will be presented shortly, and other distinguished guests, of whom there are many, ladies and gentlemen. Well, what a day to be having this lunch because we have, in, the mo in recent days in Australia, and of course, most particularly yesterday, achieved breakthroughs in human rights in Australia that many of us thought we would never see. But we have done it. We have done it.
I'm sorry to be late, but this morning um, the Prime Minister and I uh, convened, was, uh, attended a special meeting of the Federal Executive Council, um, convened by the Governor General, to proclaim the bill that passed the House of Representatives shortly after 6 p.m. last night, and that bill is now the law of Australia. It takes effect at midnight tonight. As of midnight tonight, all foreign same-sex marriages that had hitherto not been recognised will be recognised under Australian law. And from midnight tonight, notices of intention to marry under the Marriage Act may be given. Uh, under the Marriage Act, uh, that requires notice of one calendar month. So the first Australian same-sex marriages will be able to take place if notice is given tomorrow on and from the 9th of January. So this is something that all of us who believe in human rights can be very proud of. I know the process by which we got there was controversial and there are many people, including, I dare say, many of this room, who didn't like it. But it was a process that enabled all of the Australian people to lend their voice to this reform, and by that overwhelming endorsement, it made the occasion yesterday a stronger and more emphatic embrace of gay people than it otherwise would have been. It was a jubilant and wonderful day in which every Australian was a participant. Now, now, I'm pleased to be able to report to you that although the news media has naturally and rightly been full of the news of the passage of the bill through the House of Representatives last evening, that is not the only important landmark achievement in human rights which we have marked at this time. But before I pass on to reflect on those achievements, I just want to conjure for you what it was like to be sitting, I was sitting on the floor of the House of Representatives in the Senator's Gallery, looking up at the public galleries, which there are a lot of people here today who were there in Canberra yesterday afternoon. They were, of course, full. There wasn't a spare seat in any of them. And when the passage of the bill was announced, and Mark Dreyfus, who was there on the floor, shared this with me, the galleries erupted. I have never seen anything like it. They erupted in a spontaneous reaction of celebration and joy and relief and gladness. And then the gallery spontaneously burst into that great Australian song, I am, you are, we are Australian. And the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tony Smith, very wisely didn't call the gallery to order, as technically he should have done, but he let it roll. He let it roll, he let the singing continue, he let the cheering continue, he let the standing ovation roll on for minutes on end. When the history of these years is written in decades and indeed centuries to come, that extraordinary scene in the House of Representatives yesterday evening will always be remembered as a turning point in Australian history. Now, it's the privilege of very few to be able to be there at turning points in history. It's the privilege of even fewer to help them along. But I want to acknowledge the role of the Australian Human Rights Commission, the role of Rosalind Croucher, the role of Ed Santo, the role of the other commissioners and the staff in always being an ally a strong, voluble, effective, 
credible, respected ally in the fight for marriage equality in Australia. And we won. So thank you. I mentioned a moment ago that this wasn't the only very consequential human rights achievement in recent days. Let me mention a couple of others. I know there are many people in this room who have been concerned with the issue of gender dysphoria. Last Thursday, a specially convened full bench of five judges of the Family Court of Australia in the Ree Kelvin case adopted the Commonwealth Government's submissions in relation to the authorisation of stage two treatment and that obstacle has now been removed and that is a very important So let us, let us not allow our jubilation over marriage equality to distract our attention from that as well. In coming days, meanwhile, Australia will deposit the instrument of ratification of the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. The ratification of OPCAP has been, an, has been a core, a key objective of the Australian Human Rights Commission for years. Under the leadership in particular of Ed Santo, the Australian Human Rights Commissioner, my colleague Julie Bishop and I last year persuaded the Cabinet that we ought to take that step. Julie and I announced it earlier in the year and OPCAT will be ratified by Christmas. <laughs> and as well, as you know, Australia was recently and for the first time elected to the United Nations Human Rights Council. An election, an election which will, a membership which will take place from January 2018, next month, for a two-year term. Australia, as a liberal democracy, will bring to the United Nations Human Rights, Voice Council, uh, Human Rights Council a, a voice of credibility and authority. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as our friends over here demonstrate, in a free society, there will always be controversies about issues, particularly difficult issues concerning human rights. But I think today, particularly, and in view especially of the events that happened in Canberra yesterday and the other events of which I've spoken, we ought, we ought, we ought to reflect for a moment on what we have achieved, how far we have come, how much human rights in Australia have advanced in the last 12 months. And we also ought to reflect, we also ought to reflect on the fact that these decisions, in particular the nation-changing decision that was taken yesterday by the parliament, will permanently make the lives of Australians better for this generation and every generation to come. Talk is cheap. Political outcomes are difficult to achieve. But for my money, outcomes are more important than words. The Australian Human Rights Commission has been, particularly now under the leadership of Rosalind Croucher, working in partnership with the government to achieve those outcomes. We have seen those outcomes in the events the achievements I've described, we will continue to work next year and in all the years to follow to achieve more outcomes for human rights. But today, let us take comfort, let us be glad, let us be proud of what Australians have achieved this year. Thank you. Senator Brandis, thank you. We'll now move to presenting the first of our awards, the Racism It Stops With Me Awards, sponsored by the Delegation of the European Union to Australia and New Zealand. And representing the EU on the stage is Dr Michael Pulch. And also joining me to present the award is the Race Discrimination Commissioner, Dr Tim Sudpomasan.
Oh, thanks very much, Jeremy. It's been noted already, but it's a, a great day to be uh, marking a Human Rights Day and to all here who champion and advocate for, for human rights, thank you for your work. It's my pleasure to present the Racism It Stops With Me Award. This is an award recognising work in the field of anti-racism and reflects the work that we do at the Commission too. Uh, since 2012, we've had an anti-racism campaign and it's been a busy period for Racism It Stops With Me. We've gone from strength to strength with more than 360 supporters of our campaign. And during the past two months, we've released four videos on anti-racism, uh, which have had close to 1.5 million views on social media and the internet. So we like to think the word is getting out that you can stand up to racism whenever you see it. A special thank you to the EU and to Ambassador Pulch for supporting this award. And thanks as well to the many supporters of the campaign who are here today. And for those of you who aren't yet supporters of the campaign would of course be delighted to have you on board. Uh, but now to the real business. And uh, the, the finalists for Racism It Stops With Me award are uh, Clinton Pryor, who walked many thousands of kilometers across the country to bring attention to the closure of remote Aboriginal communities in Western Australia. Sean Gordon, an advocate for the empowerment of Aboriginal communities on the New South Wales Central Coast and indeed throughout Australia. The Co-Health Arts Generator Sisters and Brothers Program, which tackles racism in Victoria using a school leadership program and different art forms. Reconciliation South Australia and Act Now Theatre, who have delivered interactive theatre programs for school students on anti-racism, and last but not least, Multicultural Communities Council of Illawarra and Why Documentaries for a series of documentaries about friendships between people of different backgrounds living in the Illawarra region. And Nothing like a bit of suspense. <laughs> and the Racism It Stops With Me Award goes to Co-Health Arts Generator Sisters and Brothers Program. Just like fire, turn it up the way. I just want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank the um, fellow nominees, um, especially Clinton Pryor. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Co-Health Arts Generator, um, Liz Gab, uh, Aram Hosey, who's here with us. We flew from Melbourne this morning, um, and the participants of the Sisters and Brothers Program. I'm truly humbled by this experience, and I thank uh, the, the Human Rights Commission for inviting me and uh, Co-Health Arts Generator and, and and joining a, a prestigious uh, cohort of, of members, not only within the category, but across the various spectrum of, of human rights programs and initiatives. Thank you. I'd just like to thank all the learning communities that we collaborate with, that we've collaborated with over the last five years. Children are ready. Children are ready to change and they're, they're doing it. They embrace what we're doing and they're going to change Australia. Congratulations. Now the next award is the Media Award to be presented by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins. Kate.
Thank you. And thanks everyone here today. I know every single person here has a commitment to and does work every day to help with human rights. I will admit I changed my entire outfit so I could wear my rainbow beads today. It just felt right. And for this award, the finalists are The Queen and Zach Grieve by the Australian and In Films. This investigation focused on the case of a young Aboriginal man who was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison for a murder he did not physically commit. Bina Guri, produced by ABC Radio National. Bina Guri follows the story of Jody Barney, who specialises in interpreting Aboriginal sign languages and has worked extensively with deaf Aboriginal people in prison. The Messenger, and They Cannot Take the Sky by Behind the Wire. This work shares the compelling personal stories of people who've, who've been held in immigration detention or are subject to third country processing in Nauru and Manus Islands. Exploitation of Students by SBS's Vietnamese program. The program revealed serious exploitation of Vietnamese students by businesses in Melbourne, including cases of employees being underpaid and abused by their employers. And finally, Abuse at Oakton by ABC TV and Radio News. This investigation exposed allegations of abuse and mistreatment of people with complex mental health issues residing at the Oakton Older Persons Mental Health Service in Adelaide. And the winner is, and if you're wondering, I don't know who the winner is. It's not a setup, and the envelopes are hard to open. <laughs> the winner of the two, 2017 Media Award is The Messenger, and they cannot <laughs> take the skies <laughs> by Behind the Wires. the great privilege to be part of um, You Cannot Take the Sky and the, um, the Messenger being interviewed on that book. I think this book contains our stories, stories that we chose to tell. And I would like to acknowledge that we all tell our stories the way we want. And thank you so much for the human rights to recognize the rights of young people. And I think an adjustive investigative journalist of upcoming. Thank you for having us. <laughs> I'll just say um, thank you, honey, for saying that. So Behind the Wire was founded in 2014 after we observed that even though we hear about the policy of mandatory detention nearly every day in the media, we often don't hear directly from the people most impacted by that policy. And so we started an oral history project to try and increase the platform for those experiences. And from that came the book, They Cannot Take the Sky, and also The Messenger, um, which was produced by uh, behind the Wire in partnership with the Wheeler Centre. And Michael Green and Aziz, who is on Manus at the moment, made the podcast from exchanging WhatsApp messages to each other. And Michael Green, who has just got back from Manus, has asked me to tell you all, please download the podcast, The Messenger. It's great. And thank you all so much for this recognition. Congratulations. Now, next is the Tony Fitzgerald Memorial Community Award. It'll be presented by the Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Alastair McEwen. Hello, everyone. Wow, what a, an amazing 24 hours it's been. A real roller coaster of emotion for myself and for my LGBTI friends and colleagues. 
and I must take this opportunity to say thank you to the Australian government for recognising that my love for my wonderful partner, Michael, is equal to everyone else. To the attorney, George Brandes, I acknowledge your leadership and your commitment to the process, and I thank you and your parliamentarian colleague, and I also acknowledge the leadership of the shadow attorney. Thank you, a heartfelt thank you, and I often wonder if you will really ever know the impact that you've had. I'm onto my third box of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's been my dream to be able to say those four words, the question that you all dream of. And so my partner, Michael, is currently in Washington, D.C. However, due to the wonders of technology, I have FaceTimed him into... <laughs> and hello, Michael. Say hello to your 500 new best friends. I have a question for you. Will you marry me? What's he saying? He said yes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you. As you were. <laughs> it's my wonderful privilege to announce the finalists of the Tony Fitzgerald Community Individual Award. And we have an amazing array of finalists. The first up is Saba Vasifi, who uses her artistic and cultural activity to campaign against the death penalty advance the rights of women and children, as well as give a voice to refugees. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is Barbara Street. Barbara brought about the exposure of a decade-long cover-up of the abuse and maltreatment of residents in the Oakden facility in Adelaide. <laughs> Next up is Katia Malakai, who is a disability advocate and founder of Starting with Juliet, an organisation that aims to include people with disabilities in advertising and the media. <laughs> Alastair Lowy. Alastair is a passionate campaigner for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex community. And last but definitely not least, <laughs> Sister Jane Keogh, who has devoted more than 15 years to supporting refugees in immigration detention centres and those living in the Australian community. <laughs> and the winner is and Kate is quite right, these envelopes are very <laughs> challenging, I must say. So, uh, but like Tim, a little bit of suspense won't go astray. And the winner is, of the Tony Fitzgerald Memorial Community Individual Award is Barbara Spriggs.
going to have to read a few words, but I didn't think I was going to have to do this. <sighs> wow. I would first like to congratulate the amazing four other nominees. Each of you have achieved so much in your field working for the human rights of others. For me, I'm honoured to receive this award. I have been driven to fight for answers and change into elder abuse after seeing what my husband endured while in a government facility. I'm proud of the achievements that have come from my persistence in uncovering a decade of abuse in that facility. Not only was a review ordered into the facility, but also an independent commission against corruption inquiry. There are now unannounced audits of facilities for the elderly. The old facility was decommissioned. A refurbished facility opened. Working committees and groups are planning better care and facilities for our seniors in the future. All this has happened in the last 11 months. This award is a recognition of the need to respect the human rights of our vulnerable seniors. We must ensure that they are treated with dignity, respect and compassion they deserve. Thank you all so much for this. Thank you. Now, the uh, second community award is for an organisation rather than an individual, and I'd like to welcome, on that note, the Age Discrimination Commissioner, Kay Patterson, to the stage. Kay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, I just want to start by saying that I had the privilege of sharing the information you just heard from Al. And he said, I think you can keep a secret. So I knew, and I've known Michael since he was a student, so I want to be bridesmaid or maid of honour or something. <laughs> or I'll give them away. But it was a very special privilege to be the only person in this room who knew that, that was going to happen. So congratulations to Michael and congratulations to Al. And I just have to say to Barbara, congratulations as the Age Discrimination Commissioner to see what she achieved in making a stand was absolutely fantastic and I'm delighted to be able to say to her, well done and it's changed the lives of so many people. Thank you. The finalists, I'm, I'm about to cry over both issues so I think we, we need Kleenex tissues up here in the future. The finals for the Community Organisation Awards are End Rape on Campus Australia, which works to end sexual violence in universities and residential colleges through direct support of survivors and their communities. <laughs> Big Art. Big Art is an arts organisation which works closely with communities to address a range of human rights issues, including the empowerment of Indigenous young people and young rural women. <laughs> 2010, incorporating GLCS New South Wales, which provides frontline support for LGBTIQA people across New South Wales, including housing, counselling and social support. <laughs> now, the next one's got a bit of a regional problem, and as a Victorian, I'll use the Victorian lingo, Rural Australians for Refugees, Castle Main Branch. This is a not-for-profit organisation set up to raise awareness. Volunteers are involved in providing practical and financial support for local refugee families. <laughs> Blind Citizens Australia, which was set up in 1975 as a peak advocacy body and has, has played a key role in bringing about significant changes for Australians who are blind or vision impaired. <laughs> 
We need new envelopes next year. <laughs> now this is not been set up because I'm sitting on the table with the winner. The winner is Blind Citizens Australia. I feel so close to you right now. It's a false fear. I wear my heart up on my sleeve like a big deal. Your love pours down on me, surround me like a waterfall. And there's no stopping us right now. I feel so close to you right now. Well, hello. Uh, it's a bit of a surprise for me to be up here today. Um, more for me than for you, I think. Um, but uh, and, um, Emma Benison, the CEO of Blind Citizens Australia, uh, was coming today and her plane broke on the tarmac. Oh, always a better place than in the air, I think. So, um, And Kathy Kelly, who's here with me from BCA, said to me earlier in the function, oh, I hope we don't win, I don't want to make a speech. And I said, don't say that, Kathy. I'll make the speech. So, um, so here I am. Can I just, um, in an aside, say to my good friend, Al McEwen, and your partner, Michael, um, a huge congratulations. It is a wonderful thing uh, that you and many others who are in my life particularly two who are very close to me, that your love is now equal in this country. <laughs> but I just want to say on behalf of Blind Citizens Australia, and I've been a member since uh, 1975 when we started, um, what a huge role they play for people who are blind and vision impaired as peer advocate, uh, as advocates and peer support. And you know, in any other, in any disempowered group, peer support and being able to turn to your mate who shares the, uh, the issue which causes your disempowerment is critical to changing that situation. And Blind Citizens Australia have played a ma major part um, in that process for many years. And as the New South Wales president of the organisation, I'm very proud to receive this award on behalf of BCA. <laughs> Congratulations. Now, on an international level, the world, as we all know, is struggling with the mass movements of people like we've never seen before. That includes the hundreds of thousands of Rohingyas living in desperate conditions in Bangladesh, and also the millions of people who've fled to Europe to escape war and persecution. We're also seeing a surge in racism around the world, and it's a development that the European Union is particularly concerned about. So to join me back on stage again is Dr. Michael Porch, the Ambassador of the European Union to Australia. Please welcome him. Commissioner Rosalind Croucher, Attorney General George Brandis. Ladies and gentlemen, what an amazing and moving ceremony today. It surely is. Now, the EU delegation to Singapore is delighted to sponsor the Racism It Stops With Me Award for the third year in a row. Uh, and we do this in cooperation with the Australian uh, Commission on Human Rights. My warmest congratulation to the five finalists of this year's award. They have done an amazing contribution, an outstanding contribution, and of course, my very warm well, uh, congratulations to the winner of today. A word on racism. Nobody. No government, no organization, no person should underestimate the essential danger that racism and xenophobia presents to basic human rights and our societies. And no one should think they are immune from this danger. 
This is why I am proud that I represent an organization, the European Union, itself a Nobel Prize winner, uh, that has consistently taken a resolute stance against racism, um, for example, in its campaign against anti-Muslim hatred. And that's also why I'm humbled and proud to have that opportunity to participate in today's ceremony. Today, we recognize the contribution of many worthy people and their organizations here. A word on broader human rights cooperation. The European Union has allocated more than two billion Australian dollars over a six year period to a European instrument for democracy and human rights to tackle many of the human rights challenges around the world. And we've heard of many of them already today. This is on top of the development assistance that we provide and also have a human rights dimension. We already work with Australia on human rights issues around the world. And therefore gives me great pleasure um, to congratulate Australia to winning a seat on the Human Rights Council for the first time. Congratulations. <laughs> we want to do more and we want to do it together because I believe that we can do more things if we work together. And this is my message for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Porch. Now, it's not often that Australians win a Nobel Prize, but in October, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, as it's known, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. I'd like to welcome to the stage Jem Rommeld from ICANN. Thank you so much for this special recognition. What an incredible day, an incredible room of people. I have with me two of our board members in Australia, Sue Wareham and Daryl Lacornu, my team up on the stage. It's been a truly incredible year for us, despite the fact that we are living in dangerous times. Nuclear war, the threat of nuclear war is still making the headlines weekly, and nuclear brinkmanship has almost become normal. In the midst of this, and, and perhaps spurred on by this, after just five weeks of negotiations at the United Nations, 122 countries voted to adopt the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. <laughs> that was just a, a few months ago, and this is the first treaty to comprehensively outlaw nuclear weapons and to establish a pathway for their total elimination. It's, it sets a new standard against which all nations will be judged equally. For this work, we were awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize, which is a huge honour, obviously. <laughs> and an indication to us and the governments of the world that we are on the right track. So, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons was founded in Melbourne just 10 years ago by a small group of dedicated individuals. Uh, progress on nuclear disarmament had stalled and a new approach was desperately needed. So they travelled the world and built a global campaign coalition that now consists of around 500 partner organisations in 100 countries. We've been marching on the streets, lobbying at the UN, and we've helped shift the debate onto what really matters, and that's the humanitarian impacts, the devastating impacts of these weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> the survivors of the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, their stories, the Hibakusha, um, they've been central to the campaign, as has the stories of those who have survived nuclear testing around the world, including in Australia. Examining the evidence in brutal detail catalyzed a critical mass of countries to push the agenda forward for new international law to address the nuclear threat. At long last, nuclear weapons, along with chemical weapons, biological weapons, landmines and cluster muni munitions, are now subject to a ban treaty. 
there has been much skepticism along the way, of course, but we know the effect that a ban can have. It erodes the political status of the weapon. It makes it harder for manufacturers to access finance and resources, and it provides a tool for civil society to pressure and persuade. The nuclear weapon states have fought against this every step of the way. They've tried to thwart it, but they've found themselves to be powerless against the will of the global non-nuclear majority. Now we have a treaty banning nuclear weapons, a legal pathway to reach zero, and every nation is faced with a choice. Is it for or against nuclear weapons? Unfortunately, Australia has not yet signed on. There is much work to be done and many challenges lie ahead, but change is inevitable. It's up to all of us to make sure that Australia signs and ratifies this document. The treaty is not a feel-good gesture. It's the tool we need to drive change. We are creating a world in which the threats of mass destruction are no longer allowed to prevail. I'll finish with the words of the Hiroshima survivor, Setsuko Thurlow, who has been a big part of the campaign. She'll be co accepting the award, the Nobel Peace Prize, this Sunday um, in Oslo, and she said this on the day the ban treaty was adopted. <coughs> to the leaders of countries across the world, I beseech you, if you love this planet, you will sign this treaty. Nuclear weapons have always been immoral, and now they are also illegal. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now we go to the Business Award next, which is being presented by the Social Justice Commissioner, June Oscar. Someone was supposed to come and get me. <laughs> anyway, Jalamuru Langu, Palangare Wena, Jalamuru Yadara, Nandaji Omoi, Garigaliano. Are we feeling good? We're here on the lands of the Garigal people, and I say good day to you all. Attorney General, Shadow Attorney General, it's wonderful to have you here as always. Always. Um, Happy to um, know that we have your support. Thank you to Auntie Norma for your warm welcome to us all, to the lands of the Garigul people. And like you, I too seek healing. I too seek truth telling. And I too seek a voice for our brothers and sisters in this country. I'm absolutely honoured to uh, be taking part in today's celebrations and I'd like to congratulate and acknowledge every single one of you for the incredible work you do right across this country. And now, I um, will go through the list of finalists, and they are Allianz. Through a partnership with Settlement Services International, Allianz established an innovative employment program, creating opportunities and support for refugees and migrants. The Copy Collective. The Copy Collective is committed to workplace flexibility and dedicated to employing people with disabilities. People who are gender diverse and people who live in regional Australia.
LexisNexis, which provides resources to more than 180 community legal centres, supporting access to justice for more than 200,000 people from disadvantaged backgrounds. <laughs> Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games Corporation, or Goldock. Goldock is recognised for its commitment to plan and deliver the next Commonwealth Games in line with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. And finally, Kulbari, which is an Aboriginal-owned office and stationery supplies company committed to giving back to the community and inspiring Aboriginal entrepreneurship. <laughs> and the Business Award winner is these envelopes are hard to open. Okay. <laughs> the winner is Alian. <laughs> June Oscar, what a person to receive this award from. So we talk about Eleanor Roosevelt and where does human rights start. At Alliance, it starts with real people. These are not participants in a program. These are our colleagues. They are now our friends. Syed, Huzan, Sarah, we know their stories and we have shared them with them, real people, refugees who have come to work at Allianz in real jobs, permanent roles, not internships, not temporary jobs, real roles, not entry level positions, giving them roles with their credentials that they had in their home country, that they fought so hard to come and be a part of our country and now a part of Alliance. When we take this award away, do you know Alliance? We're an insurance company. But what excited us at Alliance is that we are part of a solution, a solution with our work colleagues and friends. This award is not for Alliance. And it is not even for the participants in the program. It's for 4,500 employees across the country who feel like, because of this program, with Settlement Strategists Australia, our key partner in this program, we've done something that matters. Thank you for that. Now we're down to the final three awards, and for that I'd like to invite the Commission President, Rosalind Croucher, back onto the stage. And we are going to present the Law Award now, to be presented by the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, if we had been celebrating the Human Rights Awards yesterday, then Alastair McEwen, my good friend and colleague, would not have been able to ask his partner, Michael, to marry him. In the intervening time, last night, love won. And that is something that we should be really, really proud of. Now, we know that success has a lot of parents, uh, and the culmination was clearly in our parliament. I want to pay tribute to the Attorney General, George Brandis, for the leadership that he has shown on this issue and on other issues, uh, human rights issues, affecting the LGBTI community. I also want to pay tribute to uh, the Shadow Attorney General uh, as well, Mark Dreyfus, for the leadership uh, that those on his side have, have shown as well. But there are also many leaders 
especially in civil society, many of whom are represented here, who were crucial players in achieving this human rights victory that we have. To <laughs> Turning to the finalists of the Law Award, uh, I am a lawyer, um, but before I was a lawyer, I was a human too. <laughs> and what all of these finalists show is that you can retain your humanity and be a lawyer. Indeed, if you retain your humanity, if you show the best of being humane, you can be a truly great lawyer. So the finalists are Canberra Community Law's Socio-Legal Practice Clinic, an innovative program that helps disadvantaged people facing a crisis or emergency by integrating the professional skills of a lawyer and a social worker. The next is Helen Pierce. Helen is the CEO and principal solicitor of the Humanitarian Group, a not-for-profit organisation focused on empowering vulnerable people by providing professional and accessible migration assistance. The Refugee Advice and Casework Service. An independent and much loved community legal centre based in New South Wales that provides free specialist legal assistance to people seeking asylum in Australia. The next finalist is David Woodruff, who has made a significant contribution to the promotion and protection of human rights for Aboriginal people in the top end of the Northern Territory. And finally, Vincent Shin and Western Community Legal Centre, Wyndham Branch. Vincent is Australia's first in-school lawyer to help children from low socioeconomic backgrounds and their families with legal advice and representation. And the winner is David Woodruff. Absolutely stunned. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the Commission. Um, um, it's an incredible honour today. I do sort of see it more as a reflection of the great work that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services and also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Family Violence Legal Services do and the work that we do. It's, it's, it's been a, a monumental past 18 months. We, we, we've seen the images on the TV that have shocked the nation about the plight of Aboriginal children and children in the Northern Territory in detention and child protection. But what's stemmed from that, and the greatest privilege of my legal career, has been to work with Aboriginal children, their mothers, their grandmothers and their communities to come forward and tell their stories to the Royal Commission. <laughs> and it's through their wisdom and their hurt, but their knowledge, but also for their wanting for a better future, that we really have now in the Northern Territory a great opportunity, a promise for the future, that Aboriginal children and families will have a place where they're nurtured with their family, secure, enmeshed in their culture and their language. And I'd like to very much um, just to say, what a day, what a wonderful day, and thank you all.
Congratulations, David. It's now time to present the Young People's Human Rights Medal, which each year is awarded to a young person under the age of 26 for outstanding work in human rights. I'd like to introduce the Children's Commissioner, Megan Mitchell, who will present the Young People's Medal. Hello everyone, and uh, can I also thank the government, the attorney, shadow attorney, and of course the parliament and the Australian people for getting marriage equality over the line. And um, I'm sure that this will make uh, the growing up in Australia safer and more inclusive for a whole generation of kids. So. Um, can I also uh, thank, uh, congratulate my colleague Al and uh, Michael? Um, and it's been a bit of an emotional journey for me too, as many of you in the room, and having been in the same relationship with my partner Carolyn for uh, 32 years, um, I think I have to be thinking about this. <laughs> um, but now for why we're really here. Um, and I want to introduce you to the fabulous young finalists uh, for the Young People's Medal. You never fail to amaze me um, with your drive, uh, your energy, and your commitment um, to social change and to justice. So, uh, the first finalist is Bassam Maliki. <laughs> Inspired by his own experience as a Muslim teenager, Bassam established the hashtag You Belong Project, aimed at fostering a culture of inclusiveness and multicultural harmony. And Bassam is 14. to Georgie Stone, a transgender advocate who at the age of 10 was the youngest person to receive hormone blockers in Australia. She has campaigned tirelessly for the rights of transgender children. And can I at this point too shout out to all of those advocates, young and old, who have in made the law change in this area so that young people and their families, with the help of the medical profession, can make decisions about their own lives. Ziagul Sultani. Ziagul is a vocal advocate for multicultural young people, promoting the rights of refugees and young migrants in regional and remote Western Australia to access education and work. <laughs> to Caitlin uh, Fiaredo, who is a young Australian working nationally to tackle discrimination and drive inclusive opportunities for young women and girls. And finally, to Celia Tran. Celia is a committed, I should get going on this envelope because it might take some while. <laughs> Celia uh, is a committed uh, to supporting young people from refugee and migrant backgrounds to expand their leadership and their advocacy skills. And the winner of the Young People's Human Rights Medal for 2017 is Georgie Stone. I would like to thank the Human Rights Commission for putting on this incredible awards night. It is fantastic just to meet everyone and to see the incredible work everyone is doing. Um, it is an honour to be receiving this award today. I would like to acknowledge Rosalind Croucher um, and uh, also like to acknowledge the Honourable George Brandis and the Honourable Mark Dreyfus, established guests, um, other commissioners, and fellow finalists and community members. Um, 
thank you to the sponsors of the Human Rights Awards. Um, and quickly, I would like to thank the Royal Children's Hospital Gender Service for the work that they do in supporting trans kids. <laughs> and also for the work they did in, uh, in the area of law reform. They made all the difference. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone who has advocated um, advocated for trans kids, their families, the kids themselves. Speaking out is a really hard thing to do and it's really fantastic to see so many people doing it. Um, people have been fighting for law reform for years and as you all know, last Thursday um, that law changed, so that was really fantastic. Um, despite this incredible win, there is so much more work that is needed to be done. Um, I was, I, a few months ago, I was talking to a group of trans kids between the ages of 8 and 12, and I was shocked to learn that every single one of them was, at that time, being bullied at school, and even their siblings. And so it made me realise that although there is so much we have achieved, there is still this social stigma in Australia against trans kids that needs to change, especially in the light of um, the marriage equality debate, the No campaign used trans kids as cannon fodder. And it was really, really hard to see, and not just for me, and I'm very much supported by my family and people around me, but trans kids who are isolated in rural areas people who have been kicked out of their homes. Really, really hard to think that these people are so isolated and then when that was going on, um, it made the situation even worse. So even though we have achieved a lot, we still need to make sure that we are protecting and looking after trans kids in Australia. Um, but there are so many pe people working on this issue, so many people speaking out now. It's not just me. There are lots of trans kids telling their story, which I think is really important. And I know we can get this done. And the world is changing. Australia is changing. And as we've learnt from yesterday and this morning, that Australia is a, a really progressive country. And we can, we can do this. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> What an impressive room full of people. Can I just say that? I, I've been looking around the room this afternoon and thinking, what an extraordinary group of people, all of whom have been fighting for rights and freedoms in our community without reaching out for the limelight, without expecting the kudos that goes with it. So congratulations to all of you, to all of the finalists this afternoon. And thank you for your work. Our final award this afternoon is the most important. It's the Human Rights Medal. Each of our finalists has made an impressive contribution to advancing human rights in Australia. They're the people whose passion and dedication keep them going where many others have and would have given up in the face of ins seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Joining us on the stage is Simon Wilkins, the General Manager of LexisNexis Australia and a sponsor of the Human Rights Medal. Simon would like to say a few words. Simon. Thanks, thanks, Jeremy. Wow, what a what a day, what what an afternoon. Uh, it, I feel very proud to be an Australian today. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be here to present the 2017 Human Rights Medal. It's been a year of great challenges, but also great advances. Uh, as evidence today to human rights, both within Australia and globally. So to be able to play a part in recognizing an outstanding individual who's made such valuable contributions to human rights development is indeed an honor. At LexisNexis, we're proud to say that our core mission as a global organization is to advance the rule of law around the world. This is a mission that is passionately supported by our staff and is developed with our customers and our communities. While there are many facets that comprise rule of law, improving access to and knowledge of the law is imperative. 
Indeed, equality in that sense is a cornerstone of democratic legal systems around the world. The rule of law and human rights are intrinsically linked. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that human rights should be protected by the rule of law, and equality before the law and access to justice are listed as basic human rights. But despite this, the UN estimates that over half the world's population still lives outside the rule of law, and that's more than four billion people struggling for access to basic human rights. We're incredibly lucky to live in a country, I think, with a stable legal system and to have an organization such as the Australian Human Rights Commission acting on behalf of the vulnerable in our society. And we've been proud to partner with the Australian Human Rights Commission on a number of projects, notably the update to the Federal Discri Discrimination Law publication and the development of Rights App, which digitizes the Human Rights at Your Fingertips handbook and creates an easy to access digital resource for those needing to access human rights treaties and conventions. The Human Rights Medal is awarded to an individual who has made an outstanding contribution to the promotion and protection of human rights in Australia. It has a prestigious history of influential and inspirational winners. And LexisNexis is really truly honored to be able to present such a significant award. To announce the finalists, I'll invite Professor Rosalind Croucher back to the mic. I said in my opening remarks that the, the theme amongst our finalists is one of resilience. Let me tell you the stories of our finalists for this year's Human Rights Medal. Anthony and Chrissy Foster. The Fosters spent more than 20 years advocating and campaigning for survivors of child sex abuse after two of their three daughters were abused by a Catholic priest in Melbourne. Their advocacy helped to bring about the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Dr. John Malouf is our next. For the past decade, Dr. John Malouf has provided surgical outreach programs for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities in Queensland at no cost to the patient. His programs aim to close the gap in health equality for Indigenous peoples. <laughs> Walter Mikak is an advocate for strong gun control and the founding patron of the Alana and Madeline Foundation. After the loss of his wife and two children in the tragic massacre at Port Arthur in 1996, Walter asked the then Prime Minister, the Honourable John Howard, to review the nation's gun laws. Dr. Walter <laughs> Jonathan Thurston, who was recently named the 2018 Queensland Australian of the Year for his commitment to improving life outcomes for Indigenous Australians. Jonathan is involved in a multitude of community programs, including Deadly Kindy, which encourages Indigenous children into kindergarten. He is also a key figure in the NRL Cowboys House, which provides support and accommodation for Indigenous students from remote Queensland communities. <laughs> Sonia Ryan, since the murder of her daughter just over 10 years ago by a man posing as a teenager online, Sonia has campaigned for stronger laws to protect young people online. She set up the Carly Fa Ryan Foundation, and in June, federal parliament passed Carly's Law to help protect children on the internet from online predators. <laughs> and finally, Ben Quilty, a renowned artist and human rights advocate. Ben campaigned tirelessly against the death penalty and produced art with Myron Sukumaran, an Australian who was convicted of drug trafficking and sentenced to death in Indonesia. Ben's other works include an installation of hundreds of vests to symbolise the refugee crisis. <laughs> and
and the winner of the 2017 Human Rights Medal, Jonathan Thurston. time I had an awards, uh, I was looking at the, the other finalists and saying to my wife, I'm no chance of uh, winning the Queensland uh, Australian of the Year, so I didn't go in prepared. Um, next minute, I win that, <laughs> so I'm a little bit more prepared uh, to, to, today. Um, this, excuse me, I'm a little bit nervous up here. Kicking a football is much easier. <laughs> Uh, the, the Human Rights Medal is awarded to an individual who has made an outstanding contribution to the advancement of human rights in Australia. It is truly humbling to be receiving this award and I want to congratulate and thank all of the award finalists and winners here today for the work that they're doing within their own communities to make the country that I love a better place to live. I'm also uh, thrilled to be able to share this opportunity with a special young Australian, Palmer, who is here with me today. Palmer is uh, 13 years old and comes from a remote community of Laura on the Cape York, far north Queensland. This year was Palmer's first year at the NRL Cowboys House, which supports some of the most disadvantaged young Australians to gain access to a quality secondary school edu education. Palmer has thrived in his home away from home, overcoming the challenge of attending a new school with over 1,200 students. The last school that uh, Palmer was at, the previous school he was at, had 20 students. I got to know Palmer and the other students as an ambassador of the house and hear their stories and come to realise how resilient and how much progress they are making in the house, which is truly inspiring to me. You may know that I'm uh, passionate about my sport, uh, my club, my state and my country. But what I'm most passionate about is my culture. Uh, excuse me. And the future generations of my people. I believe that one of the biggest drivers for social change any tissues? <laughs> uh, I believe that one of the biggest drivers for social change and to closing the gap is in education. And it starts with our young people, like Palmer, who is standing beside me. I'm fortunate enough to be in a position to work with Indigenous, thank you, <laughs> with Indigenous youth from early childhood through to young adulthood as an ambassador for programs like Deadly Kindies, which is getting parents to get their, kids, uh, their young children <coughs> to uh, Aboriginal medical service in, in South East Queensland and Brisbane. Uh, we started with uh, three medical services uh, last year. These have been rolled out to the 19 medical services, uh, providing support for disadvantaged uh, young Aboriginal people. I'm just one person in a community of leaders, entrepreneurs and innovators who are working to create better lives for Indigenous Australians. As a Queensland Reconcilia Reconciliation Awards Ambassador, 
I can help raise awareness and, recogn and recognition for life-changing initiatives that are all making a difference. I'm in this position today because of my family, the sport that I play, the club that I represent, and mentors that have believed in me. And now it is up to me to take this responsibility and help believe in others like Palmer, to have access to equal opportunity and are empowered to live their best lives. Once again, I want to congratulate and thank all the other award finalists, and it is truly a humbling experience to be standing here to uh, receive this award. While I have received a lot of accolades in my career on the football field, uh, to be recognised for the work I do in the community uh, far outweighs the things I've achieved on the field. So thank you. What a wonderful and uplifting way to finish up this afternoon's awards ceremony. Thank you and congratulations to all the finalists, all the winners this afternoon. You are genuinely an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of the Commission, I'd also like to thank the sponsors and of course all of you for coming along and making this such a terrific annual event. The Commission is very keen to hear how they did, how we did. Uh, so they'll be sending out a survey. It'll take about five minutes, but they do take it very seriously and they look out for ways to make it better next time around. You're very welcome to stay and chat for uh, the next few minutes before we have to clear out, but enjoy the rest of your, uh, your afternoon, the rest of your weekend, uh, and congratulations again to all of you.